good afternoon from London. And we have friends from all around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, as Mark always starts. We are here with yet another interesting topic and uh, a, a discussion to talk about love today. All the fluff stuff today, because we've been exploring some very deep questions and serious topics as well. But today we are going to talk about everything about love. And this is up about our two guests, a father and daughter a duo, um, Alejandro Haddad and Tamin Haddad. Uh, they're joining us from Toronto and they are Mark's guests and friends. So over to you, Mark. Well, it's a great pleasure to have um, both father and, and daughter on the show. Uh, I think Tamat, Alejandro, you and I met in Toronto a few years ago when I was speaking and, and then we met again in Cartagena, Colombia with all these former world leaders and you sat next to me and you said, look at this book that my daughter just finished. And I said, what, you wrote a book on love? I thought only the Beatles sang about love, but there, there was an operating manual. And you said, um, we're gonna have so much fun here in Cartagena, we're going to create something new, a platform uh, to you know, embed love into our economic systems and the way we may measure progress. And we knew we were up against great resistance. So I, I thank you for reminding me that in Toronto, I planted a seed uh, of the joy index in the, in the office and you implemented it. So um, we became, of course, we were instant friends from even the first time in Toronto. So thank you for joining us. I know you're a palliative care physician, is that correct? You're in the front lines, I think, at least you're, you're a teaching uh, doctor at University of Toronto. And uh, Taman, you said you're not a teacher, but I, dis I would disagree because a teacher is something very special. Um, but I want to um, thank you for joining us and your busy schedule. And we look forward to this wonderful conversation about love, not just a fluffy thing, but actually a practical action, something we can maybe embed in our previously dysfunctional economic systems. So this is what the show is about. What do we do now? Over to you, Anika. Question. Okay. So first question. <laughs> okay. So first question, the obvious question is, what made you write about love? And the second most sort of complicated or deep question is that uh, it's okay to talk about love, but in my understanding, do we understand what sort of love are we talking about? Because it's unless we love ourselves, as I believe, we can't love the other. It's about loving yourself first, which is about knowing yourself first. But in a society that we live in, the schools we go to, the, the colleges, institutions, it's constantly jarring your ego. And, you know, it's not love you're getting from outside as well. So how can you give love when you don't get love? You're getting all these bullying thing from, things from everybody like, you're not good enough, then your ego is telling you you're not good enough. So of course, if there's no love inside, then how can you distribute or contribute to this love dimension? So over to both of you and welcome to our show. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so just to kind of tackle the the first question kind of about, you know, how, how we came to write about love and, you know, share texts on love and speak more openly about love. And, you know, it was kind of hinted at a little bit at the beginning of this fluff that often when, when my dad says that I, I've written a book on love or, you know, when I'm there speaking, speaking about my background and studying love, a lot of people go, oh, and, and you're kind of like, no, oh, no, right? I mean, it's really this, it's, it's as, you were, as you were saying it, it is something about identity, right? Because really uh, from personal experience, you know, I, I grew up being told that I was made of pure love. And then, you know, as you explore different cultures and relig religions, like Christianity, Sufism, Buddhism, you know, you are, you are made of love, okay. right? Like that, that Rumi even says, we are born of love, love is our mother, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's, it's much more serious than this 
fluffiness or from this red heart that people tend to associate <laughs> love with, right? Because even speaking about self-love is, is a realization that people make a little later on because initially... Hmm love seems to be associated with that red heart, with romanticism, right? When you think of love, a lot of people think of, you know, the romantic relationship, the eros, right? Mm. Versus, uh, versus those deeper forms of love, right? And soon when you start asking people about who do you love really and who loves you and you start to explore this relationship further and you realize, oh, it's family, oh, it's friends oh it's community oh it's you know then it starts becoming a more spiritual thing as well so this is a very serious and all-encompassing topic right if we're if we're looking at it at our at our very root at our very core and um i don't know if you want yeah, to so thank you uh, and and this notion of being made of pure love which is what martha who calls me her husband i really <laughs> call her my wife because that reinforces <laughs> the patriarchy <laughs> okay uh, uh and Tamin calls me dad so i'm not her father but okay, she's not my daughter i am her father uh my mother my mother this comes from from this notion of motherhood i heard that for the first time from my mother she said alex you're made of pure love and for me it was i didn't need more explanation i could feel it then it just my mother has dementia so in in a way this is a homage to her mm. Then I became a physician, and I uh, uh, inspired by my father and my grandfather. And these two people uh, were healers, and they used love to heal. And, and I didn't need a, concept, a conceptualization of love. I, I, could, I could feel it. And then I became a physician, and I went into a production line because it became something else. Now medicine is not about health anymore. It's, it's about finances. Uh, it's a branch of the financial sector. Uh, and then I felt uh, as if I had been deceived by the system. I wanted to be a healer, and then I was forced to become a technician, okay, offering services in a place called patients, okay, and value extracted all over the place, etc. And then it became serious because I, I was exposed to death and dying, and, and I realized that we don't even talk about that. And, and then patients started to talk about love with me. And I realized that I didn't understand what it really meant. And at that time, we had the privilege to become parents. And I, I started saying the same thing to, to, to the kids. You are made of pure love. And with Martha, we decided to raise our family uh, as, um, as a love story. Okay, so wow. said, what if we become characters in a love story? <laughs> and then the conversation about love became very serious because now we had to apply it as parents. Um, and, uh, and that motivated a lot of conversation about what we mean. What do we mean by love? You understand? And, and, and then Tamen has been the leading light in our family in terms of trying to bring all these pieces together. And I just kind of want to hint a like kind of continue relay on a little bit from you know using that kind of maternal aspect and and mothers as a very significant role model you know that we hear these hints right as i mentioned like with the Rumi, with the Rumi quote but also uh, the Tao. you know this is the it's supposed to be that mother right the creator mother earth right so we see it constantly around us and and then when we talk about the self-love it's very easy to you know that that might be one of the senses of aversion that we have towards the idea of self-love is that you know that seems so inner so like for yourself right and that's um you know it's, it's very much what eric from talks about in terms of love that it's more about giving versus receiving right so there, there might be a little bit of that element of aversion to self-love because it seems all about you know towards oneself though that was that was something that I found quite tricky, um, you know, knowing that self-love was so important in the act of loving because you can only give what you have yourself, 
right? So mm -hmm. if you don't have that principle of love for yourself and, you know, with, with your various selves, as my dad kind of explores a lot with your inner voices, right? If you can't have that kind of self-compassion and that love for oneself, then it's very difficult to then, you know, if you say love thy neighbor as yourself, and if you are treating yourself poorly, then that is how you will be treating your neighbor, right? So, so I thought I thought that it was very important to spend some time on self love, and in the book I emphasize a lot that element of self love and try to pull it apart as much as possible. And um, and the biggest hint that I got, like that, has been uh, a bit of a gem, that treasure that I that I kind of uncovered and refined, you know, through family life, but through a lot of exploration has been the idea of that ideal mother, that nurturing, loving mother. And that is what we need to be thinking of in terms of how we love, right? That nature of loving, right? And, um, and, and that, that should be our standard. So when it comes to self-love, you know, people think of, oh, this is being egocentric or selfish, right? But if you think of it as being a loving, nurturing mother to yourself, and you're able to, to practice that and hone those skills with yourself, you're able to then treat others with that same kindness and that same mm. you know, nurturing and love and support, right? And, uh, and actually, I really enjoyed um, the story uh, about the bird that sat on your head during the, <laughs> during the Evo conversation. And um, it, was, it was perfect um, because I actually had a parrot myself and his name was Nietzsche. Nietzsche, <laughs> Nietzsche. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> exactly. oh, and um and <laughs> he, he was he was my love and um and and yeah you know this these signs of affection he, mm. he his form of showing love was by feeding me so he would he would regurgitate his food and try to feed me so <laughs> this essence of love as you were saying of um of uh between species and kind of this language of love it mm. further cements that idea of a of a loving mother you know that mm. this was even though uh, Nietzsche was a boy he was still able to show that nurturing and that care and um mm. yeah okay and, and which this is beautiful explanation are you probably also an invitation to go to the essence of mm. Okay? Of course. What is that without which love ceases to be? Love. Mm. Okay? Essence. Mm. And it's goodness. Goodness. We cannot be yes. of, a, of a nurturing yes. mother, a loving mother, without goodness. Okay? So yes. It's impossible to have love without goodness. So, so imagine an economic system, a new financial world, without goodness. Then <laughs> it's impossible. You see, how could we imagine that? Well, that's mm. what living now is a loveless system mm. okay? that is and it's not just the finances it's everywhere mm. because you know i i've thought about it thank you for explaining it uh, very well because it's about the hurt all of us are carrying that hurt this woundedness inside us because there's no love and i'm actually reading this uh, you've written uh, i think in your other book, The Feast of Our Life, uh, the opening words are, what is love? The total absence of fear, said the master. What is it we fear? Love, said the master. And this is so true because we all are scared of loving each other because we, want, we are scared of getting hurt. You know, it's like, when Mark knows, and you know, Mark and I talk about this love stuff, love everywhere, anything and everything is love. And people are like, oh, you know, they won't, they just block this feeling out because they're scared. The fear. Okay. Yeah, I just want to kind of, like one of, one of the, another gem that I found also was in the works of Motsu, Motsi, which, who precisely um, advised and was, he was, he was an advisor to generals during the warring states period in China. And, um, and he precisely advised and encouraged this notion of universal love. And he was able to establish these moments of peace because that's what we're talking about. When we, when we say that there's this absence of goodness 
goodness in the in the various sectors of our life it is a, it is a form of warfare this harm mm. these factions you know and you know there are fatalities as well in different senses right um and and motsu he he talks about this universal love in the sense of loving other nations the way that you love yours loving other people the way that you love your people right loving other families the way that you love your family and that is how he was able to establish these moments of peace between very contentious factions and groups right so you know bringing in these 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 wisdom you know of love where it's not fluff right it could really be a political international policy it could be you know, something that you could, believe so yeah. and i think that using the word fluff is 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 uh, a trick to avoid giving it mm. the mm. level of seriousness that it deserves yeah. oh. so um, and it happens to me i'm a professor of public health i'm a professor of medicine I give lectures, and every time I mention the word love, it happened with health first. It's fascinating, okay? <laughs> because I was talking about health and not disease. People feel very comfortable talking about disease. As soon as you start talking about health, it, 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 it becomes unsettling because we really don't know what it is within medicine. Then I started talking about well-being and happiness, and more people say, why? We miss, and, and, and people used to call me and say, we miss the quantitative Alex. I, I went to Oxford and said, we miss Oxford Alex, the one who would measure things. And then talking about love is like the ultimate, okay? That is really scary for people. And then we decided to flip it. We said, okay, hold on a second. What if, okay, we try to conceptualize it in a way that would be much more manageable for people, okay? What if instead of a state or a condition that or you have emotion. or don't have or an emotion, okay? Love is regarded as an ability. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. that could be learned as an ability. An ability, yeah. Something that could be learned, something that, that could be For taught, sure. something that could be nurtured, something that could be developed, mm -hmm. and something that could be connected to other things that we value a lot. So, and especially in a society where, you know, skills and getting better and improvement is, is all around us, you know, if we are able to kind of speak that language and goodness is something we understand very inherently as well. So, you know, through the ages, through studying 5,000 years of history on the concept of love and how it's been applied and how it's been understood, you know, um, we've been, we, we were able to, to distill uh, a a conceptualization that has essentially five different components to it and it, it the 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 phrase that you know we're calling it a conceptualization rather than a definition because definitions are inherently problematic right so yeah, because you know, the conceptualization to... is an effort to translate ideas into words or or, or drawings mm -hmm. knowing that they are imperfect and that they are going to be constantly in evolution while a definition you see, requires precision. Uh, you see, you need to find the right words and those words together need to apply at any time in any context, which is impossible, okay? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, yeah, of course, Mark. Oh, no, keep going. I'm gonna ask a very pragmatic question next. Okay, <laughs> so essentially- Somebody said there is nothing more pragmatic than a good theory <laughs> <laughs> and a good concept because without those, nothing could be built. Thank hmm? you. Thank you. So essentially distilling all of this history and kind of, you know, we purposefully call it a conceptualization of love as an invitation to continue to refine it and play with it and test it and, you know, keep it at the back of your mind to see whether it continues to, to, to hold up and, you know, so we can get closer to being able to speak the same language. Um, so love could be conceptualized as the ability to wish good do good see good and feel good so that that has so it is it's the combination of all of those at the same time so as we said the it is an ability that could be taught it could be improved upon you know and eric from supports this idea as well in his in his explorations um 
and it's it's more than wishing good right that oh. that we know that that is a natural component of, of love is that you you must desire the best for your the object of love though there's an element you know i while i was doing this exploration i looked at the 10 most popular languages in the world like most spoken languages in the world and found the word for love in each of these language and then explored the etymology of each of these words as well and I noticed that there was that element of action as well that there wasn't that it was allow me just yeah. for a second in, in willing good or wishing good we also have it in Thomas of uh, Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. who said mm -hmm. love is to will good okay yeah so, so we see it in almost every it's impossible to love without wishing it to yourself and others you see so it's not enough though which mm -hmm. is what what exactly. is the point? Exactly. There is that action that's involved. Though it starts to, like, as you kind of layer on, you know, there's that, that seeing good, right? And, and it essentially, you know, a lot of it gets captured by Nietzsche's phrase, amor fati, which, because he was talking about, the, he, he, he was very cynical in terms of love, you know. But he was very sickly too. He yes. Had very yes. sickly. A lot of faith. Yes, yeah, and he didn't have the best luck when it came to women. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Once in his life. And it killed him. Right? <laughs> probably he got sick of it, and that's what explains the, the, name, yeah. the, the madness of the last 10 years of his life. And he <laughs> obviously didn't have a very close relationship with his family and such. So, so yes, naturally, we can understand that, though a gem that came from his, you know, he, he did believe that love was, you know, a deception for us to you know, keep living essentially. But what he, he, he did believe in a love very fervently and it was amor fati, which was love of, you know, fate essentially. So whatever came, you would love that. And um, so, so that's part of the seeing good element um, that, that no matter what, that it has to have that resilience, right? But also, you know, in, in the, in kind of the text, like Freud's text, he speaks of love, you know, in this healing process and how in the moment with the patient, um, you have to have this unconditional love and this openness for this healing, right? So it's the seeing good and this perseverance, this resilience in love that must be there as well. And then there's that final component, component, which is the feeling good, right? Which is what we've touched on, which has to do with that self-love element. That mm. if you are sacrificing yourself and your own well-being and you are, you know, destroying yourself in this, in your pursuits, in your acts of what you would call love, it's not truly love, right? And that's something that Aristotle also speaks of is this cycle of love that it's through one and the other and it and one can't exist without the other so um, and this requires giving ourselves permission mm. and cultures joy pleasure are associated with sin mm -hmm. yeah. okay, with, with what is not good and, mm -hmm. and it's quite the opposite you see we may have to go to 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 pre-christian times okay to understand that joy even in Christianity, which has been misunderstood, yes. okay? uh, uh, it's a central element. So, so this element of even pleasure associated with goodness, you see, is, is important. And that feeling good is essential. We need to give ourselves permission to be touched, to be healed, you see, mm. by... Okay, and the and willingness think, and the acting and And the, that would make this kind of system of economics and such to to work is remembering that feel good element, you know, like as like just kind of speaking listening to John's work as well and that you know how we were talking about how well I say we because I felt like I was in that conversation with like you know, with you reflect on uh both of you. You know, I'm in this place, this privileged place. The Associate Finance Minister of Canada called me, uh, or the Chief of Staff to the Finance Minister. Her name is Lucy. And uh, before COVID, she called and said, uh, the new minister, um, Monteforte, who is also the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity, which I started to laugh. I thought, the That's middle amazing. class are an endangered species, said, uh, we know you're in, you're, you have this interest in well-being budgeting. And I said, yes. And I said, I'm working with First Nations and that on this front. Uh, I'd like us to talk about how we can, right now, where we have this window, especially in Canada right now, to 
to present a new budget that could be based on what you've just spoken about. Goodness, you know, that, and it's not just Canada, but maybe Canada could be the model in this COVID fear condition. I, I find it interesting, Health Canada says COVID-19 is a disease. So language is important here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to talk about the pragmatic things like on the front line, you're working on the front line in Toronto. Uh, we are, can we build, and we know we experienced that resistance, you and I, Alejandro, in Cartagena. We knew that we were up against, when we say love in the room of former world leaders, there's an anxiety, there's a like, no way. We know what that is and we're going to, there's an immunity system that yeah. says. And there may be an opportunity here, even to use the language of epidemiology, the language yeah. of pandemics, because pandemics are not just exclusive to infectious, lethal. Right. Mm. But Let's talk about that. So I yeah, want to talk yeah. about this. We, we have a kind of, a, a, actually a natural um, reaction to this virus of greed I would say a virus of materialism and consumption. I love the word consumption. I once heard that Lao Tzu, that's how you say it in China, Lao Tzu, actually the legend is he was running away. He was running to the border with Tibet and the border guard stopped him and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm done with this. I'm done with all the leaders and generals. I'm washed my hands. And of course he was full of love. And he said, you can't leave yet until you write it down. So he had to write it down, right? Uh, so here we are, we are in this beautiful moment, a moment of, of uh, you know, a pregnant moment where we're midwives of maybe a civilization of love, but we're also on an important life point crossroad. So I want to talk about the practical things we can do in our, whether it's our personal lives, but then at the larger systemic level. And we started these conversations with, with real management, Mr. Abadi and John's story. I never met John until I heard him with Anika. And so this is how we started this program with, yeah. and we found love principles into our governance, real management systems. And, and if not, why not? And is this now the time? Is this yeah. the time to? Accelerate? And, 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 uh, and Mark, uh, if we go back to goodness, I think that is the root of everything. Yes. You say to the minister of finance, uh, do you want badness? Do you want evil? Do you want goodness? Okay, I want goodness for the population. <laughs> so now we're speaking. We're, 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 okay. yeah. so let's start from goodness. Okay, do you want to do good? Okay, okay, yes, yes. Do you want to? So you will good. Do you want to do good? Yes, okay, okay. Do you want to see good through this, an opportunity through this crisis? Yes, okay, okay. And would you like to feel well about what you're doing? Okay, we are talking about love. <laughs> okay. so we are talking about love. And, and, and John, let me just. Can I just interject here? I have no doubt that the action of good is a real role, task for somebody or some people in any organization. When I was asked about to join this particular gentleman to set up a bank, he said, come and join me. I said, I'm too busy, but eventually I went. And he said, so what, I arrived, he said, so what are you going to do? I said, don't you know? He, and the boss, the founder said, no, I don't. No. I said, well, I'll go out and do good on your behalf. He said, fine, carry on. We never discussed my job again. I didn't have a job title. He didn't tell me what I had to do, where I had to go, or what I had to do. My task was to do good. So fear, which is the negation of love, mm -hmm. becomes a dominant force. And that's what has happened until now. The more fear, the less love. Yeah. Unless yeah. we understand what we were discussing earlier, which is that love is about goodness. And as a minister of finance, you want to do good, okay? You don't want to do evil, so to begin with. Okay? So if it is about goodness, then it's about, about love. And then we need to put fear within this context. Fear is a force that comes from the future, okay? It's, 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 it's something that is related to a threat to our integrity, either physical, emotional, or, or cognitive, okay? It, 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 it's sometimes a life threat. It's a threat to our lives. And, and there, are, uh, I have had the privilege to support over 500 people from the time when they realize they are mortal. Mm -hmm. So, so I fears. One is the fear of death. It's not only the physical death, it's social death. If you're a minister, you're afraid of ruining your career if you make a, 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 the wrong decision, okay? So then there is fear of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. so, so physical, emotional, or financial. So for a minister of finance, there is a big fear 
of bankrupting the country, for example. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then there is the fear of failure, which is like a ghost. We have people afraid of failure. That's one of the big ones. Until we realize that, that, that it's a construct, it's something that we have created, that we can make it relevant, and we can spend some time on that. Like our money system. It's exactly. a creation of our imagination. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And then there is fear of ridicule. If I'm going to talk about love, what would people think about me? Or, okay? or fear of embarrassment okay? and disappointment. Mm -hmm. So we should have compassion and, 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 and empathy, which is an element of compassion, and then say, okay, if it is about goodness, okay, now let's not even talk about love. Let's talk about goodness. And goodness is at the heart of well-being too. Because being well requires, okay, to experience a good life. That's and and we know that etymologically, uh, wealth and health are close cousins. Well, love meaning well-being, and health meaning uh, physical well-being. Th yeah. the letter th the condition of something. Yeah, and it's about being whole. Whole, and, uh, whole. That's whole. right. Thank you. That's what it means: is to be whole. Hella. And, whole. And, and, and that is is good. It's good. It's goodness, yeah. So, so then it helps us even approach what was the first subject of our conversation, which is how do we assess the development of a society or the, or, or the degree of, of, of uh, um, progress in a society? Okay, and then we recognize that our indicators have focused almost exclusively on a verb, which is to have. Okay, well-being, as you, you know, have, yeah. and, and you inspired us in terms of, of, of well-being, has to do with the satisfaction of material needs. That's what we have been doing almost all the time. And this yes. is the fundamental problem of our society. Exactly. So it's to have, to have, to have. Okay, and we have ignored the fact that there is a limit beyond which having more is less. It, it, it threatens our well-being. It threatens the goodness in our lives. Okay? Yes. So then we can start weaving love with well-being with indicators of, of social development. Okay, I, I, I even don't like the word development. By but, but also no. honoring feeling, uh, you know, as an economist, I'm noticing, and you as a physician, we're so focused on objective measures of something. And we, we negate the emotion, the perceptional or subjective experience of your emotions. And, and your, not that, uh, Mark, not only that, we think that those things are objective. The GDP is objective. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, the GDP. Okay? Yeah. Because that, <laughs> that is, the, that is the, the obsessive, okay, uh, uh, topic for people in positions of power at the macro level. So, so it's to have, it's to purchase, it's to obtain, it's to grow, it's to, okay? Uh, and then all these verbs might be enough, but they need to be put in their place. Okay, so we need to ensure that to have is satisfied, okay? Because we need to have basic things. We need to have food, we need to have shelter. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of complement this, it, it's almost like that we're ignoring the giving part. Like even within the equation of GDP, it's almost like what do we have from others and what do others have from us? You know, mm -hmm. not so much like what are we like what are we giving you know in in this sense of you know giving versus having well the, the important thing about gdp not to focus because i'm an economist is gdp measures a transactional economy mm -hmm. transactions only measured when money changes hands but not time or love or yeah. relationships or trust none of those matter in the gdp equation yeah but if speaking of a minister of finance transactions are important Money is important. These indicators of whatever are important, but they are not sufficient. Okay, so I think there is a room to say yes. The verb to have has a role. Okay, and it's important that every person in this society have what is needed. Okay, to be able to conjugate other verbs, which <laughs> make like oh, to need is one thing. It's we are acknowledging the needs of a minister of finance. So it's to say, uh, to have is important, not sufficient. Okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Then there are other verbs, okay? There are other verbs which are very important. To be, okay? To do, to feel, to love, okay? So, yeah. and love has four verbs in it. You see, to wish, to will, to do, good, to see, good, 
and to feel good. So then we bring these elements into the picture to enrich that. And what are the conditions that would enable all those verbs to be conjugated? You see, and how as a minister of finance, you can create the conditions where money ceases to be a barrier for this. So then money and your budgets and all that should be enablers of something much bigger, okay? Rather than the main, the main objective. And we have indicators because now we have managed to look at the different frameworks. We have looked at frameworks of human development and basic human needs, Max Neff and Martha Nussbaum, and Francis, uh, Stewart. Francis Stewart, uh, uh, Amartya Sen, etc. And, and, and there are some common elements in all of them. And we have been able to identify, led by Tamen, a, a few elements that make a good life, a full life. Okay? And some of them require some financial resources, most of them require the freedom from worry about the financial side, okay, to be able to flourish. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is so important. Uh, we notice, of course, in a lot of countries, and especially Canada, women are leading in terms of keeping calm through this COVID crisis. They're the, they're the voice of, uh, of reason and calm. And Tamin, if you were selected by the prime minister right now to be Canada's chief love officer, and you'd be standing next to him every every day. We get a briefing at 11 a.m. I think, at least in Alberta, from Justin Trudeau, and his hair is growing longer. He's prettier every day. Um, what would you be saying to Canadians today? I mean, we are talking to the world. We may only have 200 followers right now, but what would you be telling Canadians? Um, I think a big part of it, as we were, as we were talking about, has to do with that ability, right? And in an ability, you need to, there's an element of learning, and there's an element of practicing, and there's an element of teaching. So it's, it's also kind of sharing these insights and enabling people to kind of practice, you know, this goodness, this doing good, seeing good, feeling good, and willing good, right? Because also, you know, as we were talking about with, uh, with social media and with kind of how societies are developing, even that wishing good element, you know, requires some work as well. Though something that, that has a concept that has infected me profoundly in our exploration of you know what it is to have a full life and these elements like that we must have or that free us that we will enjoy when we're free from the burdens and fears and stresses of finance there's this concept that we that we put in there to evaluate because yes we had all the elements that you need for a full life though we came upon that that moment of okay so how much should we like what does it mean to to be have a full life is it if you have uh five hours of free time per day is it because you have you know and then it's terrible if you only have one hour or is it you know that you don't enjoy your food enough so what is enough enjoyable like what is enjoyable food how how can i tell you whether you have a full life or not so our realization was in the concept of enough mm -hmm. So the more it, we, we say it a lot and it's in a lot of our common phrases, you know, in our daily life, though, when we focus in on it and we think <laughs> about it and we allow ourselves to notice it and almost meditate on that word enough, we realize how omnipotent and omnipresent it should be and how, how powerful it really is. So, so mm. now is the time of thinking of enough. So right. this is a profound reflection. Again, it's reflection on enough is profound because a lot of us being at home now uh, are realizing that, what do I need? I need food. I need to call my parents, make sure they're okay. I need to make sure my children are okay, that the dog needs a walk twice a day. Maybe the dog is so lucky like your parrot, you know, can't believe how lucky the dog feels. But these basic bundles of goodness or enough is really what and I said, told this to the finance minister's chief of staff, is what if we just ask Canadians, what is enough for you at this moment? Just, just to get by, not to be caught in fear, but maybe it's that $2,000 in your bank account that just gets you through the next month or the next three months. But now we can step back and go, wow, we lived through this with just the minimum things and we didn't have 
we weren't now in shopping in our wants realm, we were just in the needs realm. And this defines a new kind of economic model, which mm -hmm. to me, it's a lower GDP, it's a less money needed in the system, it's less speculative finance, it's all of these things. Then now we can imagine, why don't we now pursue this new economic model legitimately, as Alejandro and I, we tried in Cartagena, mm -hmm. maybe it was too early, but now, is now the time? Do you think now is the time? And what, what I mean, rhetorically, what's going to stop us from now moving in this direction? Yeah, and, and Mark, uh, thank you for, for appreciating. And, and, and as a family, we thank the men for having, because it was an insight, this insight of enoughness. Okay, what is enough? Because yeah. we looked at all these frameworks, and it was very hard, because we humans uh, are also insatiable. Sure. Yes. Okay. So our way to handle insatiability is by noticing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Notice, and one of the things that we must notice is what is enough. So, so yeah, we have thirty-six items and enough that create a framework. At the same time, we need to future-proof this. So now we are talking about Prime Minister Trudeau or Minister blah blah. How can we make this transcend time frames mm -hmm. and 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 legislative or executive government period? So one of the concepts that we would also like to, to share is the concept of a social contagion. We are, at the time of a pandemic, we need to be aware that pandemics can have different forms. Even the word pandemic is <laughs> not exclusive okay, to diseases or to bugs or to microbes. Pandemonium. <laughs> the word pandemic, pandem pandemic comes from two terms, pan or demos people. It's something that affects or could affect all people. And how about law? How about goodness? So here we have an opportunity to recognize, to notice that not only microbes are contagious, a virus, okay, or a bacteria, a bacterium or bacteria, but ideas, mm. emotions, mm -hmm. behaviors are contagious. So we have a wonderful opportunity if our brains are more receptive and they are bound to be more receptive to be um, delivered in the sense of, of, of recognizing that we can create social pandemics and that these pandemics could be positive Beautiful. or negative. So we could have a pandemic of fear. We could have a pandemic of helplessness or hopelessness. Well, we can have a pandemic of goodness, of generosity, of benevolence, of, of decency, as Albert Camus said, you see, of solidarity, mm. okay? of enoughness. Okay? A pan pandemic of recognizing it. what's enough and that we are part of something much bigger okay this recognition of being part of, of, of something that we are not the superior beings who have uh, custody you see who are the custodians of nature we are part of nature and that if we're not careful the mother earth okay, will ensure that we come to our senses okay in a very spinozian way god as nature as everything as all okay mm -hmm. so this is an opportunity and how can we capture it? And how can we ensure that our economic and financial systems play the role as enablers, not as drivers, as enablers of human mm -hmm. flourishing as part of a planet that can thrive? And I think that it's, it's exactly as I was saying, you know, once you have this time to realize and to set a new standard for yourself, a new realization, if we give ourselves permission to notice this and versus rushing out saying, I want everything to go back to normal, you know, and oh, I'm craving normality, right? It's kind of like, how, what can we take with us from this time that will, that will cement these senses of, you know, love, for one another, you know, this appreciation for one another, what is enough? You know, this idea, I mean, we walked through a mall that was completely empty, you know, just at the start of, uh, of, of the crisis. And, um, and we were, we were concerned about, you know, what food, what protective gear, oh, we're so glad we're all together as a family. This is great that we're going to be in here. And then when you saw that hat, that bag, that was like, this is what you know it's almost like we're dispelling this this delusion that we that we thought that that those things entered in our concept of enough right so it's kind of like what can we you know it, this is such a gift of a time for appreciation of life for you know 
being full of life, right? And exploring this concept of, of love, you know, amongst our family, amongst the people that we are, you know, in quarantine with, you know, and whoever we share our spaces with. And, you know, the, we 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 should we should take it slowly you know even at a personal level we're all concerned about how is the economy going to get back to it what is this mm. you know but but also for ourselves at a very personal level how are we going what steps are we going to take to ease ourselves back into you know the street really that's the but it's kind of like what are we going to take with ourselves how are we going to and this we i think is an important because it could be lowercase we or capital W and E we mm -hmm. and, and, and to recognize that uh, when we talk about family it's not only family by genes or mm -hmm. by law but there are other modalities we can have families by choice we have you see families by, by affinity but we are part of a much larger family which is not only made of humans we, 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 we are members of a family of living entities and, and even the notion of life and we don't we tend not to spend enough time thinking about the concept of life okay this, this is an opportunity also to say what do we mean by life which is not the absence of death by the way and okay. that mother is our is love that our mother life's mother is love the source okay. of life it's love. beautiful that and was so beautiful. Tamin, I love you. Can I just say? <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Thank I'm you, well, guys. Thank you. <laughs> this was the message I think everybody needs to listen to now. And maybe this is why it's out there in our consciousness. Thank you for sharing with everybody. I'm sure whoever would listen to this message would get affected because it should affect everybody. This is the time to come together and love each other. It has happened, it has happened and we... Um, I think the, one of the main issues that we have to face is possession. Um, it's the having and the wanting and the needing and the Maslow theory, but we've gone far beyond that. We want to possess things. From a personal point of view, I possess nothing and I have nothing and I don't want anything because I was born with everything I needed to have and I had great faith in that. Possessions, any possessions I've ever had, have got in the way of me living. This great thing that we have to do is, as you so correctly said, Alejandro, living. How do we live a full life? And it's not by being possessed by anything, it's by being happy, <laughs> having freedom in our hearts and freedom in our minds to explore life in its fullness. And this is what every human being, I hope, can do in the span between birth and death that they have. So it's live life to the full, experience it to the full, and manifest the, the joy of that full life to everyone possible. And that's what you've shared with me, and that's how I feel after listening to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and as a family, just to, I don't know if you want to say something, about 10 years ago, we, we sat as part, because we are characters in a love story, and we live by wishing good, doing good, doing good, and, and feeling good. We really mean it. And, uh, um, so we said, what is enough? And we decided we had, a, we had a big house full of stuff. And as a family, we made the decision to open two suitcases each and put inside the two suitcases what we would consider enough. We closed our suitcases and left our house and gave everything away. Everything wow. away. <laughs> so, and on the 30th of June, of every year, we go through the ritual. We just say, what is enough for us? We put things in two suitcases, we close the suitcases, and everything that is outside those two suitcases is given away, okay? And, uh, wow. and now, wow. yeah, and now, yeah, and now we realize that what we need fits within one or two suitcases. I'm experimenting with one now, okay? Uh -huh. And, and, and uh, just kind of talking. I think it's about emptying yourself. This is what about, you know, the emptying, like you don't then belong and attachment to things and all that. It, it's emptying, it's a paradox, is to empty yourself, to feel yourself and to feel others. And, and then it becomes overflowing. And, and yes. this is just kind of talking about things and, you know, kind of filling and fortunes and such. There's, and, and love naturally, there is a quote by Albert Camus that my dad showed me that I absolutely loved. And I think it's, uh, you know, very timely for now. It, uh,
um, especially with this having and, and giving and, you know, what we have and enough. Um, he says, for there is merely bad luck in not being loved. There is misfortune in not loving. Ooh, beautiful. <laughs> it's a joy, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege. Thank you guys for coming. Lots, lots of love to both of you. Lots Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.